Okay, clapping now. Hello, welcome. My name's Jack and I'm a visiting fellow at the university. Um, in my day job, I am a coach development manager for the Football Association. And in this video lecture, I'm going to be giving you some advice from my experiences working out in the field in practice with coaches in coach development over the last decade or so. So apologies in advance for the predominantly football examples that will no doubt come your way through this video lecture. But I think that some of the themes that I present are fairly applicable regardless of what domain that you're coaching within sport. So first thing, So first thing, um, if you haven't already watched it, then I highly recommend that you uh, have a look at Ash's video lecture that he recorded uh, for last year's cohort around planning, organisation and management of coaching sessions. There's some really good um, practical advice and principles that, that Ash discusses in there that I think you'll really greatly benefit from. What I'm going to try and do here is, is almost extend upon that and maybe fill in some of the gaps. Um, so what I'm going to present to you is some of the common problems and pitfalls that coaches face or that I, I see that coaches uh, experience in their own practice. Um, we're going to try and pick them apart a little bit and then come up with some solutions that you may be able to um, find useful in your own practice. And certainly when you come to your assessment, hopefully some of these um, will, will help you with that. Um, so this is a model that I think coaches, um, most coaches would really benefit from understanding. So um, if we take from top left to, to top right, uh, the model of simple to complex. So um, for example, this afternoon I made lunch. Uh, I took a recipe from the internet and threw all the ingredients in a pan, cooked it together, um, and no matter what order or um, I put those ingredients together, the outcome was likely to be the same. A complicated system is one where you've got a number of um, a number of pieces or parts and generally the order has to be the same for them to be, uh, for the outcome to be correct or, or what you desire. You take a complex system, for example, raising a child, um, there's many moving parts and it's highly unpredictable and that's uh, very much what coaching is. It's, a co it's complex in nature. Um, and when we're trying to teach human beings, which are another complex system, um, a sport, which is also complex, um, it, we, you know, it would really help us to understand that the environment in which we operate in is, is complex, um, which means that what works for one doesn't always work for, for another. Uh, we have a problem, I believe, in, in our society with what's called reductionism. So we attach simple solutions to complex problems um, and that's not necessarily the way that the world works. So um, if we look at invasion games and team sports, especially uh, are highly complex. So with that in mind, we need to think about where we are currently as, as a coach. So you might, um, one simple analogy that you might look at is are you a cook or a chef? So, and there's, you know, we're not a right or wrong answer within this, um, but most coaches will start out as cooks. So a phrase that I hear often is, uh, Jack, have you got a session for X, Y, or Z? So can you help me? My under 10s um, are struggling to uh, play out from the back. And it's almost like the, the coach is just longing for a simple solution, an off the shelf in, um uh, recipe that that coach can then deliver to his or her team and boom the problem solved well that's not necessarily how uh, how learning in, in sport and human beings works um, so cooks uh, absolutely nothing wrong with them and, and you'll find that the majority of, of the grassroots coaching workforce in this country will probably be cooks um, and that's fine until the unexpected happens uh, and this is where chefs are able to deal with uh, problems and situations that occur probably more 
um, with more uh, ease than, than a cook. So a chef is someone that has a, a, an in-depth knowledge of the subject, or in our case, the sport. So a chef will understand how to subtly manipulate a practice and what impact that can have on players. Um, and chefs are also able to deal with the unexpected, which in, uh, in the field of coaching often happens. But they're also able to predict um, what's likely to happen as well. And if you want more information on this analogy, I highly recommend an article by Andy Abraham and Gareth Morgan. So if you just Google their name and are you a cook or a chef, you'll find the article there, number one hit on Google. So um, I'm going to take you through some common problems that coaches find now. Um, and one of the most common is that, is that for, uh, forgetting for whose benefit. So we Many coaches will jump to the X's and O's straight away in their planning without considering maybe who the audience is um, and understanding why they're there. So, And this is where context becomes key. So you might be uh, coaching in a grassroots environment, for example, where you get to see your players or your, your, your athlete for one hour a week. Um, and it might be about maximizing that time, but understanding why that athlete or those players are there. Predominantly, it might be for, for fun to be with their friends and we have to understand that as coaches but on, on the flip side you might find yourself working in a, in a highly elite professional environment you might see your players or your athlete over several hours a week and could be performing for olympics worlds whatever uh, title it may be so it's understanding um, for whose benefit is the session it's it's not for the coach's benefit, it's often for the, the athletes, participants or players. And we need to understand that as coaches. And with that knowledge, it's it's about the priorities. So the, the model here, this is something that, that we use in the FA and um, many other governing bodies of sport have, have a similar model. Um, and it's this is really a, a way of, of looking at what the holistic needs of the player are in so we're not in our sport football so that you've got the technical tactical um, physical psychological and social and what a number of coaches often do is jump straight to that top left red corner technical tactical and ignore the other the other boxes um, and that's a problem so if we if we jump to straight to the top left or just isolate then then, then it often leaves us with a with a bit of a problem um, because what we'll start to do then is just focusing on, on the what rather than the how of our coaching. So with this in mind, how do we plan practice activities and coaching behaviours to support the development of complex skills um, in unison with the complex systems of the human body? So if these human systems don't operate in isolation, how might we develop them together? So what we want to do is bear these four corners in mind and what the returns from our practice are in each of them um, and almost give them equal value and, and start to think about how we might develop them together. Um, another problem that I see coaches struggle with is, is overcomplicating things. So meticulous planning is it can be fantastic, but only if you're comfortable from deviating from it. So often I'll see coaches who will deliver their set or will plan their sessions literally down to the, the second and wonder why it, it all goes wrong when uh, when they when they haven't yet developed the ability to deviate from that plan so another problem is because when it becomes too much so I, I often find that coaches will try and cram in probably three or four sessions worth of work into one practice or one one session and will stick rigidly to it. So by hook or by crook, this is my session plan and this is going to be delivered. Um, the common habits and behaviours I see from the more effective coaches is they will have a plan, but they're not afraid to deviate from it when necessary. Um, I heard an interview with an uh, England hockey coach and he said that in any given session when working with the international players, he will have... Uh, a session plan, but we'll probably only ever deliver 50% of it. Um, and we'll come on to what the other 50% might be later on in this video lecture. So my advice would be um, less practices, um, less worry about uh, filling time with loads of different practices and, and keeping the players entertained. 
Um, and think about more ways of variating those practices. Okay, so um, one thing that you might consider is um, repetition and realism. But before we look at that, is is the relevance? So, is what you're planning on delivering to your your athletes relevant to their needs? Um, so, for example, if you were a under, an under sevens football coach, um, you might not necessarily or Switch in play with 40-yard long lofted passes might not necessarily be a relevant practice theme or focus. So think about, is, is what I'm doing relevant? And then you might start to consider um, the repetition and realism of what the players are actually experiencing. So I'm going to talk you through a few examples of what this might look like. So something with high repetition um, but low realism is something I'm sure we've often seen in our sports, which is two players stood opposite, passing back and forwards. So they're getting loads of goes, if you like, but actually, um, when you compare that to what they actually have to do in, in their game, so in this instance, lacrosse, that, that situation will very rarely, if ever, happen in the game. So they're doing loads of repetition for something that probably they're not going to actually face in competition. Um, so high repetition, low realism. The next one that I'm sure you'll have seen is um, when you've got low repetition and low realism. So the example I've got given here is a, a classic dribbling relay. Um, you've got queues of players who are then going to go and dribble around cones. Um, so effectively, you, the players there are only active for one one go in three. So a third of the time, they're dribbling around uh, stationary objects stuck to the floor that don't move. But in the game when they dribble at players, those defenders tend to move. Um, so I would say very little realism, very little repetition in, in this type of practice here. Then you've got um, lower repetition and high realism. So in my context, in a football context, this might be um, an 11 v 11 game. So you might have a, a certain focus, um, but in, in the chaotic random nature of the game, that focus might not necessarily present itself too often which isn't necessarily a bad thing because it's it's realistic to the game um, and then finally if you look at um, a practice that might may have high repetition and high re realism potentially a small sided game or some kind of conditioned game and I'm, I'm sure you'll have all played these within your own your own coaching so the choice really is or, or the, the challenge is to um, reflect upon the types of practice that you're planning and where might that practice or practices fit within this matrix um, and have a really honest conversation with yourself and really ask the question of why. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I delivering this practice? Culturally, I think we feel like we have to work on the left side before the right. So traditionally, a, a practice might be um, turn up, a warm up, um, then go into some drills, which are generally far away from the realism of the game, um, into maybe some kind of skill-based practice again, with varying degrees of realism. And then if and only then, if the players have behaved themselves or have um, done what the coach has, has asked or has expected, then um, the players get the, the carrot, if you like, of the game. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it's, it's culturally um, something that, that we've always done, and I, you know, I beg to question, you know, why is that? And and maybe even from the the point of view of, um, we don't if we only ever train in in the game like practices at the end of the session when the players are fatigued physically and mentally, do we actually get the most out of that that practice? What if we flipped it in its head, and and what if we put the um, the game type practice first to see how the players cope with it when they're fresh? To see what they've potentially learnt from the previous week, and then if they if that's working, great. How can we extend it? Um, and I, I understand the pressures that often coaches are under to deliver those practices on the left hand side that may look tidier or more convenient, or actually give the the coach more opportunity to to dominate the practice and almost show off what they their knowledge to the parents. So it's a it's a good way of of looking at practice this spectrum and, and thinking really critically about 
what am I doing? Where does it fit? And why am I actually doing it? And is there an alternative or better way or more appropriate way for the players that I'm working with? So one of the, the next common problems that I see coaches grappling with is this notion of transfer and it links from what we, we just spoke about previously. So um, use the example here, you've got a tennis player who looks like she's practicing volleys at the net. So uh, one theory might be that the coach um, or the, the, the player uh, might perform a, a series of rep repetitions of volleying the ball over the net into her opponent's court. Um, and so that would be the during phase of, of this small model here. So the learning focus might be um, to improve uh, volleys and we'd be well within our rights to give the player loads of loads of practice at volleying at the net. But what the coach might not have considered is actually what's, what's the point um, that's happened previously that would lead the player to get into that position at the net. So at what point does she make her move? What's the trigger or the cue that, that makes her move from the back of the court to the front of the court to be ready for the volley? So that's the before. What, once she's hit the volley, well, depending on where that ball has gone and where her opponent now is, um, that's then going to have a, a cue and a trigger for what she does next. So by purely just focusing on the during, that, that technique of, of volleying balls constantly into the opponent's court, that she might get really good at that, but I would, I would say that she would struggle to transfer into into the actual match because she hasn't necessarily built or developed um, the where and when and the why, and so that's something that you might consider when you're planning your practices. Is okay, great, focus on the drawing, but what might be uh, the moments in competition that would lead to that moment, and what might they do after that moment? So something to consider. And that leads us to, I suppose, the next problem I see coaches dealing with. It, it, and it's you know not through their own fault, but it's that experience of knowing what to do, what you don't know what to do. And many people define learning as, as that. Um, so having that backup plan. So I've seen it many, many times. Coaches will deliver a session and something comes unstuck and they don't know how to change it. And suddenly the, the player experience is um, diminished because there's no backup plan. So one of the ways that we can look at this is this notion of differentiation. And it's a word that you'll probably come up with quite often in your, um, in your studies. So we're trying to get coaches to consider moving away from everyone having exactly the same experience. In other words, equality or the, the, the image on the left here everyone has the same size box, to equity. So in other words, equity is giving giving the players or the athletes what they need. Um, and that only comes from understanding your players and your athletes. So what we're, we're trying to do is um, manipulate um, our practices to try and uh, offer equity or deal with difference. And one of the ways that we might do this is through this acronym called STEP. Some of you may have heard of this before, but sometimes when you don't know what to do, there's only really four ways that you can um, start to manipulate a practice. So you might change the size, the space, or the area of, of, of the practice, or the shape even, that the players are working in to bring about different outcomes. An example of this might be if you were trying to teach your players to play forwards in a football environment, you might narrow the pitch off so that... Um, so that they can't play wide. What this would then do is constrain the players to, to play forwards more often. Um, you could change the task, in other words, the rules or the conditions of the practice. So m many of you will do this um, without maybe realising it already. So that could be a shot clock or um, certain rules around which who can go in which areas, for example. Um, two touch, three touch, one touch finishes is, is a uh, is a common example from from football um, and you can look at the equipment so how does changing the equipment um, affect the the outcomes from the practice so do some have does everyone have the same size gate or goal to try and score in or does some have bigger or smaller and how can you manipulate that equipment to um, to try and deal with the difference or, or offer this equity um, and another 
Uh, lastly, you might consider the people or the ratio of players. So certainly in a team sport environment, um, often we'll, we'll long for even numbers. So I remember when I first started coaching, um, I would be praying for, for 12 because 12 was like a magic number. You could, you could have pairs, threes, fours, sixes. Um, and when I got to 12, I was hoping that nobody else would turn up. Um, but actually, that was assuming equality in, in the session. Um, and often coaches will get flustered maybe when they have to deal with a prime number such as 7 or 13 because oh, how, do you, how do you divvy that number up? Well, um, actually, we need to get comfortable as coaches with dealing with those situations. So not in your planning, having an understanding, not necessarily of the exact number that are going to turn up to your session, but being able to deal within a range. So when I, when I coach in my voluntary capacity, sometimes we'll have eight turn up and sometimes we'll have 16 and we'll have anywhere in between that. And I've got to be able to react and adapt to that um, in my sessions. So not getting too hung up on for this session, I need X amount of players um, and being able to um, manipulate the practice to suit. So an example might be um, uh, I've got 12 players and I want some um, some kind of uh, opposed work, but in, in small numbers. So I could have a, a 1v1, uh, a 2v2, uh, a 1v2 and a 2v1. So all going on within the same practice. Um, and who I put in those scenarios and situations um, would depend on who needs what. In other words, the, the equity side of things. And one of the last problems I think that I see is the this notion that um, culturally coaching and teaching is seen as imparting knowledge onto others or in other words filling up the empty vessel and often coaches will um, not necessarily provide very much ownership or choice or empowerment to the to the athletes in their care and this is something I would really recommend that you, you start to do in your planning process is how do you build in this empowerment and ownership and choice um, for those that you're working with in your coaches and, and give it a try. I've seen this work as young as five and six years old, just asking the question of, you know, what, what do you think to the athlete or players? And you can get some incredible responses back that are so creative and often that the coach has never considered before. So try to look past this, this one way dynamic of coaching being, uh, you know, the coach has got to impart all his, her, her knowledge onto the, the learners and, and look at it from the, a different perspective. Okay, so I hope you've um, you've enjoyed this lecture. I hope you might have taken uh, one or two practical pieces of advice that you could use in your own uh, session planning, delivery and management. And um, I hope to see you again soon at some point in the programme.